we'll just take a moment to say hello and welcome. Um, I am Marcy Rubick and I'm the executive director of the Limb Preservation Foundation. And um, we are really thrilled that you are here with us this evening. So thank you so much for making time. We are looking forward to providing you with a really great program and hopefully very helpful information for you um, if you're a patient or, um, and we also want to share that we have a lot of patients and providers um, with us here this evening. So we want to um, take a moment to actually thank all of the providers who are on the call for your dedication and service to the limb community. So thank you on behalf of the Limb Preservation Foundation. Uh, this is the first um, uh, symposium that we have going, but we are planning to do many more of them if people do enjoy them. And we'd like to alternate between uh, the audience directed for patients and providers. So following this evening, we are going to send you a survey and we would love to get your input so we know how to shape these for the future. Um, so though with that, um, what I would like to do is, um, our seminar is called, um, it's um, Overcoming Limb Challenges. And we'd like to share the latest research and have you hear from patients and caregivers. And what I would like to do is to introduce our panel, our, our um, moderator this evening. So if we could just have it there, there's our next slide with um, Jenna McMullen, who is, oops, um, Jenna is our um, moderator. She is a limb patient survivor. She is a Limb Preservation Foundation board member. And um, I'm going to let her take it away and share anything else that she would like to about herself before she kicks this off. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. I appreciate it. And once again, welcome everybody. And I'm sharing my welcome and my gratitude, not only as a moderator for this evening, but also um, as a survivor, as a champion for everything that we're going to be able to discuss tonight. And just I'm very appreciative of the time that you're sharing to come learn a little more and, uh, and hopefully become a champion for the Limb Preservation Foundation as well. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got an exciting program this evening, and if we could please take a moment to mute yourselves uh, during the presentations, but then make sure you know where that mute button is if you want to come off of it during our question and answer session at the end. We'll have an opportunity to have some engagement after we hear from our panelists. You can also put your questions in the chat box on the right hand side there and we'll make sure that we get to those um, this evening. We are recording um, and so we'll have an archive version of this evening's discussion available afterward that we'll be sure to send out to everyone who registered for the seminar. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome our panelists for this evening, but first I want to call out Ethan Schlemmer. Um, this is a gentleman you see on the screen here. He is a, a limb condition survivor. He was a scholarship recipient also of the Limb Preservation Foundation, which is just one of the many ways that we seek to support our patients uh, in their journey. So with that, if we can move to the next slide and get a peek at who we'll be hearing from this evening. Very excited to have Dr. Daniel Lehrman here, who's gonna kick us off sharing some of the latest advancements in treatments and uh, medical innovations uh, that really add up to the quality of life and considerations for patients and their families. So a little bit about Daniel Lehrman here and over that, I'd like to welcome him and, um, and hear more about his expertise. So Dr. Lehrman, thanks for being here this evening. Thank you, Jenna. It's a real privilege to have the opportunity to kind of relay some of my thoughts, feelings, and some kind of new information on the topic. Um, as an orthopedic oncologist, my number one goal was really um, life preservation and providing kind of life-saving interventions. And a close number two goal was really function salvage. So, you know, how do we attack these problems with maintaining the patient's optimal function, not only for them to be able to perform activities of daily living for, but for also self-identity and do activities that we identify with being oneself. So oftentimes our goal is limb salvage. So limb salvage, um, whether it be through surgeries, radiation and reconstructive surgeries um, is 
a primary goal, but there's times, and Alyssa will speak to this, where either salvage isn't a viable option or the salvage limb just wouldn't be as functional as a prosthetic limb. So there's many times where an amputation is actually a, a better functional surgery. Now, even with modern advances in prostheses, there's significant limitations for prostheses and prosthetic wearers. And so one of the things I want to talk about today is <clears throat> something called osseointegration. And osseointegration is an advancement primarily for patients who have an above knee amputation. Whereas one of the significant limitations of amputees, and you'll hear about this more, is that <clears throat> the thigh sits within a large soft tissue envelope of muscle, which sits within the fat that kind of surrounds our muscle and then within the skin. And all that thigh has to fit into essentially a socket or a bucket for our above knee amputees. And the femur then has to drive that socket. And you can see on this slide, an X-ray of an individual who their typical standing posture in their conventional socket is the femur kind of drifts to the side, putting pressure on the socket. Now that's clearly a very indirect way of transmitting any sort of energy or force. Also, <clears throat> you don't really have a sense of where your prosthetic foot is in space or on the ground. So there's an advancement now that has really recently been FDA approved where we can put a metal implant into the patient's femoral canal, into the femur itself, and bring that implant through an opening in the skin so that it is connected directly to an artificial prosthesis. So the significant advances that patients report is it allows them to have negative feedback from the ground. So when somebody puts their foot on the ground, they can feel that the the ground is underneath of them. They also even can feel differences in texture, say between a carpeted surface and a hard surface, because it's transmitting directly from a prosthesis <clears throat> into a, a metal device into the femur itself. And so that femur, our bone, is able to kind of give us that sort of sensory feedback, which is significant. Um, we can go to the next slide. So uh, this procedure that is FDA approved is done in two stages. Stage one, we put a metal implant into the femoral canal and close the end of the residual limb and let it kind of marinate in there and cook in there for three months while the bone of the femur grows into the implant. And then stage two, we create an opening <clears throat> that you see kind of on the right side of the screen where the muscles are tied down to the femur and we bring the implant out through the skin. In the next slide. This was the first gentleman we did here in Denver. And the implant that's FDA approved has a handful of sites in the United States. And you can see from that map there, but this is Asif Dori. He was special forces in the Israeli army, he moved to America. He was a police officer in Florida and in the line of duty, he lost his leg. And that was 15 years ago. When he came to me, he said, all he wanted to do is walk with his daughter, his daughter who's 12 years old. And <clears throat> I have three daughters of my own. So even telling the story, I tear up a little bit. And, and he and I were like sitting there crying with each other when he just told me he wanted to walk hand in hand with his daughter and he'd never been able to do that. He's never been able to tolerate a socket because he has some sensitivity of his skin. So he was our first patient we did here in Denver and this is him walking. And this is about three months after the operation, that image on the left. On the image on the right, <clears throat> you can see he's a little heavier because this is before he was able to be active. And he has this kind of short training prosthesis because he hasn't loaded his femur in 15 years. So we slowly and gradually get people back to walking. I think there's another slide that may be relevant for this. This is Asif's radiograph. And that was the first time he was standing up and he stands up, he's 6'1". Um, so he was, I'm six feet tall. So he was looking down at me for the first time because I've only ever known him to be in a wheelchair. So that was another kind of emotional moment for the two of us. <clears throat> so not being an amputee, I can only relay what patients say about this. And <clears throat> what I hear consistently is people really feel kind of like they have their leg again, so to speak. Obviously, it's not a natural leg, but having it directly connected to their skeletal system really allows them much better control over the prosthesis and feeling the ground. So instead of having to look where they take a step, instead of having to look and know that the prosthetic foot is on the ground, they feel the prosthetic foot on the ground and then can kind of look up when they enter a room like they were used to doing. So that, I think, <clears throat> really feels invigorating for a lot of patients. Um, next slide. So to transition a little bit away from some technical advances into my perspective as a caregiver, um, these are two patients who have become friends. Um, I didn't take care of Alyssa really directly, Dr. Kelly did, but Amber Smith on the left of the picture um, is somebody who I feel very close to in the next slide. So there's a lot of patients who come in and I, I make a lot of relationships and the relationships begin to become very intense very quickly. 
because <clears throat> I'm in the privileged position of unfortunately dealing with people who are kind of finding out about life changing, life altering and life threatening conditions in very real time. And sometimes just uh, the fear of not knowing they may have some of those conditions is more overwhelming than the condition itself. So some of <clears throat> the points that I hang my hat on um, really is the key to this whole relationship for me and the key of being a doc and taking care of these patients is really ensuring the patients know they are the captain of the ship. And that's something that I, I say every day. And um, while the patients are the captain of the ship, I like to act as navigator. I'll help read the charts, read the seas and the tides, help people get to where they wanna go. <clears throat> but really, I don't assume what anybody's goals are. I don't assume that I know what they want to be or who they want to be. And so I need them to kind of direct me in really what our goals are for their care. Um, you can see these are a few bullet points that I kind of that resonate with me and, and empathize. So <clears throat> it's, it's easy to say, but sometimes hard and emotionally exhausting to do to really do the best I can to, to put myself in the patient's seat. Now, I've never been a patient of a life threatening condition. I've been a loved one and a spouse of somebody with life-threatening condition. And that has very much informed the way I practice and the way I care, having kind of seen how bad it can be done and seen how great it can be done too. Um, to be open and honest <clears throat> with my patients, I know that almost that sounds obvious, all these things sound obvious, but unfortunately I see them just not necessarily executed as much as we would like them to be. So uh, I'm very transparent. I'm transparent with what I know, with what I think, even when sometimes it's wrong. I'm also transparent with what I don't know. Um, and that I think is the key so we can at least be on the same page with each other as far as a doc and a patient. Um, so we know where we're headed, we know what information we need to get. <clears throat> and then just to recognize the trauma of the experience, just I me mean, hearing bad news, I tell people bad news and I see the, their whole world change in front of their eyes. I see their life spin, their loved ones spin. So <clears throat> knowing that that's happening, being aware that's happening and not just marching on with like the next directive or the next test we're going to order, but taking a moment to recognize that we may have to just regroup as a room and catch our breath so that we can have a meaningful conversation going forward. <clears throat> and then uh, establishing a game plan. So oftentimes I find that the scariest part of the experience for patients is the unknown, is the not knowing. Even when we have an aggressive and life-threatening diagnosis, there's some closure and some solace to that. At least then we know what we're doing, we know what we're treating, but kind of the unknown, the waiting time before one gets biopsy results, I think seems to be the most uncomfortable for people and really the most torturous. So trying to expedite that process, get an answer, even if it's a scary answer, because then we can move on with the plan. <clears throat> and then checking in, that kind of goes back to being the patient being the captain of the ship. So I don't take for granted that I assume what somebody's thinking or afraid of. I have patients who have rather insignificant diagnoses compared to the other panel members. And um, they can start crying and be very upset in the office with me. And, and I always ask, you, you know, I can see something's bothering you, what's bothering you? Because <clears throat> I don't take it for granted that it is necessarily what I think would be bothering them. And sometimes it, it's not. So it's, it's interesting that they may express a worry or a fear that I wasn't really keyed into and, and wouldn't assume um, had I not asked. And then, Every encounter, I just, I welcome questions. Be, just because I think I've been thorough and clear, I, I know that I'm not. And I also know that the trauma that somebody's going through, hearing bad news, hearing life altering news, <clears throat> definitely clouds anybody's ability to take in information and to process things. So I really like to close out any meeting and conversation, just knowing that we may have to say everything all over again, and that's totally fine. So I welcome that multiple times throughout any visit, particularly when it's one of these really kind of early information gathering and sharing visits. So these are kind of some of the things that I keep in my mind with really any new patient or early patient encounter. And these are <clears throat> things I've developed primarily as a doc, but also again, as a, as a loved one of somebody who's been through a little bit of it. Um, and that is the silver lining I got to take away from that experience. So no matter how much I kind of read into what my patients are saying, and I, I know I miss the mark sometimes, I know I, I misread their body language or their reactions sometimes, and I always just try to note that and get better at it. But there's really no better way than hearing from the patients themselves. And 
um, I continue to be curious and interested and want to learn and improve. So I feel very privileged for everybody else who's sharing their experience and their story during tonight's symposium. Thank you, General. Thank you for all that, Dr. Learman. I mean, just remarkable all around from um, a, a treatment option that, that changed the life and the story that you shared, uh, but then also how important it is to take a minute to, to translate in a way, the feelings, the information, the experience, because it, it can absolutely be a lot. And I think what you've also hit on is these conditions and approaching them, they're team sports and the caregivers are an incredible part of that team. And so with that, I'd, I'd like to turn and, and welcome um, Susan Brockstein, who's gonna tell us a little bit about that caregiver experience. Um, so Susan, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Oh, Susan, I, I think you might be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Here I am. Thank you. Um, my name is Susan Brockstein, and thank you, Jenna. My husband, Maury, had a ski accident in December 2012. He broke his tib and fib on his left leg. The orthopedic surgeon put a long plate and screws in his leg. He also had some nerve issues in the lower leg and foot due to the accident. He had a few weeks of physical therapy, rehab, but it seemed the leg was not healing properly. Luckily, we were sent to the limb preservation specialist who figured out that Maury was suffering from staph and bacterial infections. Dr. Ross Wilkins and his team saved Maury's life and limb. Maury underwent several surgeries, infection, complications, over the four year period from accident to recovery. Maury's team of doctors consisted of orthopedics, plastic surgeons, and infectious disease specialists. They all worked together to get Maury healed and back to some normalcy. I was his main caregiver throughout that time. And I'm here today to share my story, tips and advice, and in hope I can help others who are caregivers to limb injured loved ones. The story of my husband, Maury had been an avid skier, road biker, hiker, marathon runner. He was in incredible physical shape. Then in an instant, life changed. He suddenly became wheelchair bound after his injury. The accident was a life altering event. Usually after a person breaks their leg in the way Maury did, they have surgery, do PT for six to eight weeks, recover, and back to normal life. Maury's complications led to a different scenario. The most difficult time was the months after the accident when he was essentially homebound except to see his doctors in Denver. We had a home care nurse three days a week for several months to help with wound care and IV antibiotics teach me how to care for Maury. I needed to shift my mindset right away from going about our business in a normal way to tending to my husband's total well-being. His nutrition, personal care, being a patient advocate and a care coordinator was my responsibility. This was my role as a caregiver. Many years earlier, Maury was 29 years old and was diagnosed with cancer. We had a nine month old baby and was taken by surprise. We learned how to navigate challenges and difficult situations early on in our life. It taught me about caregiving and prepared me for Maury's limb recovery process, which turned out to be a longer and more challenging event. The skills and experiences that we endured at that time prepared me to be able to face another crisis in our life. Maury made a full recovery from his cancer. Some advice that I want to share with caregivers is listen to your patient. You are, your, you are their voice and advocate. Have patience and compassion of what they are going through in difficult situations. Give your patient the courage and strength every step of the way through their recovery. It helps to have a positive attitude. You need to have a care team you can trust. Your patient needs to be able to trust you. When you find the right provider, 
whether doctors, physical therapists, it helps to have the trust in them to steer you through the recovery process. Maury's team of doctors guided us through his care. It was very important for Maury to set goals and work toward them. As a caregiver, you give them the confidence and support to meet their goals. Whether it was from being in the wheelchair to the walker, using crutches and then walking on his own, being his cheerleader definitely helped in a, every step of the way. Maury's second surgery where Dr. Wilkins found major staph and bacterial infection in his leg was the most difficult of the four surgeries. He had lost 24 pounds from the time he broke his leg on December 22nd to seeing Dr. Wilkins on January 17th, which was less than four weeks. The infection had taken a toll on his body. As the caregiver, I worked with the doctors to make a plan, which included his nutrition, vitamins, supplements, medication to fight the infection and heal his body back to good health. I asked questions and researched to see if I could find new information that could help with his recovery. After each of Maury's four surgeries, we had to reset his expectations and take baby steps to get to his goal of walking on his own again. Being able to laugh and cry together at times and have human connection between us helped with his healing. Our son Adam was a huge part of, our, of Maury's recovery, as well as being a supportive and positive influence during the most difficult times. He helped me during a couple of Maury's surgeries, having our family together during some of those most challenging times were key to Maury's recovery. We were fortunate to have a strong network of friends and family um, that gave us time, love, and listened to us each and every day. As a caregiver, you need to lean on others and accept help when you need it. People brought food and listened, gave us emotional support that was incredibly beneficial. As a caregiver, you need to take care of yourself. Get your sleep, sleep is very important, and you will be a better caregiver if you are feeling your best. Allow yourself to accept the situation. Always focus on the positive and what you can do and not the negative. Make sure you set up times when you can recharge yourself. For me, I wanted to get out, hiked, went for a bike ride, yoga, baked and cooked. That made me feel recharged and I could be the best caregiver to Maury. Sometimes you may experience sadness, anger, and fear. Talk about your feelings with your family and friends or seek professional help if needed. You will feel better once you get the support you need. Some of the reason, some, I'm sorry, some of the lessons I learned that I wanted to share to be the best caregiver, you definitely need patience, compassion, understanding, attentiveness, dependability, and trustworthiness. These are the very most important traits that attribute to being a top-notch caregiver. I always encourage Maury every step of the way and having a sense of humor helped us through the toughest days. Maury and I have more gratitude and renewed perspective for the daily things in life that we took for granted. We are enjoying life in our new normal each and every day. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Um, sure. As you were speaking, I was thinking that there are certain situations in life that just don't come with the playbook until you encounter them. And True. what you have spelled out here is a powerful playbook that I know was, was hard fought and was not easy to pull together. And you've just done so in such a thorough and thoughtful way. Thank you for everything that you shared. Mm -hmm. This is certainly gonna make somebody else's experience that much easier. So just a really great comment. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And you know, as we, we think about that team sport, you know, centering around and supporting that patient, I'm really excited to welcome Alyssa Little next to share a little bit about her experience and how her doctors, her caregivers, uh, the rest of her team came in handy um, with what she has survived and triumphed over. So Alyssa, welcome. Hi, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Jenna, for the introduction. 
Um, it's nice to be here virtually with everybody. I wish it was in person, but um, someday soon, I hope. Um, so like I said, my name is Alyssa Little. I am a cancer survivor and an amputee. Um, that's me and all of those photos. That's uh, on the left. That's me right before, um, really right before I was diagnosed with my cancer. I was diagnosed with stage three Ewing sarcoma when I was 22 years old. Um, getting to my diagnosis was a pretty long journey, even in itself. Um, I first started out noticing some swelling in my, uh, in my right leg, in my calf. Um, and I talked to my mother about it and we were both kind of worried that it might've been a blood clot. Well, what 22 year old gets a blood clot, right? So I called my doctor and, um, it thankfully was not a blood clot, but, um, it kind of went undiagnosed for a while. We kind of, um, tried a few different things. They, they, they suggested that it was a hematoma. So pretty much a, a bruise, a deep bruise in my muscle. Um, they told me to ice it, to put some heat on it. I tried compression socks. Um, basically felt like now it feels like we were kicking the can down the road a little bit too long and too far. Um, so a few months had actually passed and I'd gone back to my doctor and pushed back saying something's, something's really wrong here. This swelling has not gone down. Um, I'm still, I'm still seeing it. It's not going anywhere. It's not a bruise. Something's really wrong. We need to do a scan. We need to get some more testing done. We need to push this a little bit farther than ice and heat and compression socks because that has not been working. Um, that led to multiple scans and those scans showed sure enough, there was something there which led to a few different biopsies, um, which led to my diagnosis of stage three Ewing sarcoma after that. So April um, 20th was my diagnosis date. Um, and so I, I, I kind of celebrate that day as a, a, I have a few birthdays every year and I, I, um, I celebrate my diagnosis day. I celebrate my chemo finishing day. I've been, I celebrate my amputation day. So it's, um, I have like quarterly birthdays that I like to celebrate for myself. Um, so right when I was diagnosed, once I got that official diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma, obviously my world kind of got flipped completely upside down. Um, I had to take a leave of absence from my job and I immediately started fertility treatments, which I was really lucky enough to get to start before starting my chemotherapy um, regimen. It was something that I really, looking back, I'm so grateful and so happy that I was able to do that and to fit that in before my treatment started because the chemo regimen that I was gonna be getting was, um, there was no way of knowing what it was gonna do to my fertility afterwards. So. Um, so I was lucky enough to freeze my 10 little eggs right before starting treatment and they are stored away in a uh, Loctite facility down in Denver whenever I'm ready for them. Um, so I went through a few, and then after that, I started my uh, chemotherapy. It was a pretty intensive regimen that I was getting. Um, I got it down in Denver and it was not fun. Luckily, I didn't have to do very much inpatient stays. I got to just go home and sleep in my own bed and that was probably one of the, one of the greatest things for me. Um, so I started doing a few months of chemotherapy treatments and that we, we did that. We waited on surgery in hopes that the chemotherapy would kind of move the tumor away from where it really was. It had wrapped itself around the muscles and the nerves and it was behind my kneecap and it was a spider web of mess. Um, a few months into my chemotherapy treatment, we did more scans to see where the tumor had kind of moved to and if it had kind of moved in the way we wanted it to. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. So I was, um, instead of a limb salvage surgery, I was facing an amputation. Um, and that was something that I obviously struggled with accepting. Um, when I, It just didn't feel real to me until I was hit with it in the face. I just kind of assumed, oh, it'll be fine. It's going to move away. We're going to have that limb salvage surgery and everything's going to be great. And I'm going to have two legs and it's going to be wonderful. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case. And that's, um, that's just how life goes sometimes. It, it's, that's, it's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, so I was, uh, I worked very closely with my doctors, um, figuring out the best plan for me. I was able to prepare in a way going into it. I had the option of going with 
um, either an above the knee amputation or going with something called a knee disarticulation. And that was, I'd never even heard of that before. Um, and that's where they amputate right, uh, right at the kneecap. So I still actually have my kneecap and um, I chose that surgery because I kind of viewed it like it's not a haircut, right? Like my leg is not going to grow back. I can always go shorter later, but I will not be able to go longer later. Um, so we went with the uh, knee disarticulation surgery in September. Um, I'm now three years and about seven months uh, out of my amputation and living my new life. And uh, I'm getting married. I'm buying a, well, trying to buy a house in this market. It's, it's tough, but it's going. Um, I have a dog. I walk her around a lake. And it's, it's a distance that I really, when I first had my amputation, I could hardly walk down the hallway. Um, and now I walk my dog around the lake and I did a 5k. That's that third picture there. I, I actually walked an entire 5k and I had a meltdown at the end because ugh, I'm getting emotional. Sorry. Um, Yeah, so I did a 5K and it was just something that I really like didn't think I was actually going to be able to do. It did it. Jeez, I'm so emotional. Um, okay, so I can't imagine why, Alyssa. Just... What? So I can't like, imagine what? why you would be. We're all, Whatever, we're, right? we're all with you on that. Thanks. You were, you were there with me on that. You walked with me. You walked that 5k with me. And I love that. And that just showed so much of the support that I had from my medical team that they were there. They were doing these extra things and supporting me in my life after my amputation. You know, it, they didn't just leave me in the dust, right? Like they supported me. They pushed me to do better. They pushed me to achieve greater things and to achieve the life that I really wanted for myself. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, so I'd love to share like some of my advice and some of my bigger lessons that I learned. Um, so my first thing is to be your strongest advocate. Um, know your medical team and be comfortable with them and the decisions that you're making together. I, when I was faced with choosing what type of amputation I wanted, I was like, how do I know? How do I know what I'm going to want later? And that was a conversation that I had with my medical team was what's going to work best for me? How is this going to fit into my life? How is this going to fit into my goals? And what's going to be the best option for me and the safest option as well? Because obviously I still had to worry about the cancer. Um, so limb salvage was not an option and it, it and that, and I'm okay with that. Um, but it came down to choosing a longer or a shorter limb. And at that point, I just, I didn't know what would be best for me. So I worked very closely with my medical team to come to that right decision and to feel comfortable with that decision. Um, and now I still see them every few months and I have my check-ins with them to make sure that everything's still going smoothly. And um, I meet with my, I call him my leg guy, my leg guy, my prosthetist. Um, and we work very closely on finding the right systems that work for me. And I think that's a huge thing as an amputee is obviously there's a lot of hardware going on that is like attached to my body now. There's a lot that I have to think about, like um, how my knee flexion goes or how it comes down the stairs or um, how quickly my, my knee bends when I take a step, things like that, that I work very closely with my, my leg guy to make sure that I have it in the best setting and the best options for me. Um, my next thing would be to let LPF pair you with somebody. If you're somebody that's looking or facing a limb challenge and of any sort, um, one of the best things that happened to me was being paired with Amber. Um, Dr. Lehrman mentioned that when he was speaking earlier and Amber and I have become like best friends. We, she did not have an amputation, but we connected on the cancer level and um, a limb challenge level. 
Um, we've become each other's support, strength, shoulder to cry on, uh, cheerleader, what have you. We are there for each other no matter what. And we are bonded over such a crappy thing, but over something so great that brought us together and like this really amazing friendship that that bonded us to really have somebody there that that gets it is is an amazing thing um another thing is to meet others with limb challenges so kind of like going off with what amber said or what what i said about amber um meet others with limb challenges one thing that i had a really hard time with in the beginning was that i didn't know any other amputees like that was just i didn't know any amputees that was just that um, so it was hard for me to find people to relate to. When I was first realizing that I was facing an amputation, I like went all over Instagram and Facebook and any social media platform that I could find to try and find somebody else that I could like really relate to. And what I was finding was a lot of um, Paralympic athletes and Brazilian models. And that's just not a crowd that I was able to relate to. Those were not sharing the everyday things that I could relate to. Um, so I found um, the Amputee Coalition actually hosts a, a conference every year. And I went to that my first year as an amputee. And it was like this life-changing experience where I was all of a sudden going from maybe knowing one or two amputees from from my time with my doctors to all of a sudden going to this conference and there's people from over across the country there with, with limb loss. And one of the most amazing things to me, there was a, a lazy river at this hotel where this conference was. There were legs and arms just thrown across the pool on this lazy river. And I thought it was the best thing to like be with my, my crowd and all these people that really get it. And they, they understand the challenges and they understand how it feels and the frustration and you know, really being able to, to learn from those people and learn from what they've gone through and using their tips and advice to help me in my situation was, a, it was really a life-changing experience for me. Another thing that I've really enjoyed is looking for different opportunities to become more active. I would not say that I was like a star athlete by any means before my amputation, but I was a pretty active person. I like to go around and do active things. Um, and I was unsure of how that would go in my new role as an amputee. Um, I applied for a grant through the Challenge Athletes Foundation and I was gifted um, a running blade. And that's been a lot of fun for me. It's been something that has gotten me outside. It's I'm by no means in my running marathons, but you know, it's gotten me outside, it's gotten me active, it's gotten me doing something more fun more fun than I thought that I would be able to do. Um, another thing that I got into is I actually received a Peloton grant. Peloton um, has a comeback program and they give out free, free bikes to people that apply for it that have had rough situations. Um, and and I, got a, I bought a trike um, to, to ride outside. The two wheels outside is a little bit dangerous for me. I don't really have that gifted balance um, to stay on two wheels. So the trike has been, has been a lot of fun and, and um, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. So another thing um, is to take it one day at a time. Um, you will have those pity party moments and those pity party days. And that's just, that's okay. That's okay. But you can't live in those moments. You can't live in that dark space. You can't live in that sad time. Um, and that's something that I've really had to learn is to push myself out of that and to realize my life's not a depressing story, right? I still have a happy ending coming to me. I still have all of these amazing things in my life. I have my family, I've got my friends, I've got my job, I've got, you know, so many amazing things working for me. And yes, my, I hit a speed bump, but that doesn't mean my, my car has stopped. My car is still going. I just hit a little bit of the speed bump and, and then that's okay. So taking it one day at a time, you, it, it's really been a crucial thing. There's those moments that I just get so frustrated that I'm like, why me? Like, this is just, this sucks. And that moment typically happens at two in the morning when I have to pee and I have one leg and then I have to jump my butt to the bathroom to pee at two in the morning. And that's just a frustrating thing to do. Um, so jumping right from that, be easy on yourself. 
Like that has been one of the biggest things that I've had to push into my brain is to like be easy on myself. It's okay for me to have those frustrated moments. It's okay for that to happen. Um, my life was completely shaken. Um, my, my body, my mind, my spirit, they were all shaken to the core with this new lifestyle that I was being given and this new challenge that I was going to be facing every day. Um, and, and it really has forced me to see myself in a whole new way. Um, I realized that I was stronger in a lot of ways, both mentally, physically, emotionally. And, and it's been an amazing journey and a really interesting learning experience even within myself. So um, yeah, so those are some of my, my, my fun tips, not fun tips, not fun tips my lessons, the biggest things that I've learned and some of the helpful stuff. And um, I did provide them with some of the resources that I've used. Um, so the Challenge Athletes Foundation, the Amputee Coalition, there's different Facebook groups that I joined when I became an amputee that, you know, have really helped. And it's um, connected me a lot with a whole community of folks that really understand what I'm going through and can offer me advice. You know, how do I walk in the sand. That was, that was something that I asked on, on one of these Facebook groups. Like, does anybody have any tips for walking in the sand? So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Alyssa. You probably didn't see some of the comments in the chat box while you were talking. And so I, I want to oh. tell you what they were saying, that you are fantastic. You are an inspiration. You are amazing. And that the vulnerability that you've shown in sharing your story is truly inspirational. And the, the community that you have built is because you've been sharing. And as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, yeah, that's, yeah, that does happen. Oh my gosh, there's somebody else out there who gets it. And it's, a, it's about, you know, taking the walls down and not having patients be isolated. And what you did in sharing that has just expanded the community even further, just with such strength. So thank you very, very much, Alyssa. Yeah, and with you. that, uh, Time to have some questions and answers to have a little panel discussion here. So just a reminder um, to use that chat box. You can pop your questions in there. And uh, otherwise you can also raise your hand on the Zoom here and we can have some live interaction. So I'll go ahead and kick it off with a theme I heard of resilience from each of the speakers and just the mindset of approaching these challenges that are often unforeseen. And so I'd love to hear from the panel about how, how that resilience has, has fed into your learnings and into your work. I can jump in first if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, so, so the resilience factor has, I think that that's really come into play so much more in my more recent life than my directly post amputation life. I think that my world was completely still shaken up and I didn't have my bearings on my life um, pretty much at all um, until later on. And I think that that's something that I'm, I'm really focusing on now and pushing myself to continue to get out there, continue to try new things, continue to not pity myself and continue to um, just, just push for the life that I always wanted for myself. I, I have a question for Susan and Alyssa, because I get, is a question I get asked and for any patients who are listening, feel free to chime in. And I, <clears throat> COVID makes this particularly relevant because everybody keeps talking about when COVID's over, when COVID's over, when COVID's over, right? But we all know it's like one of those things that's not really binary, right? It's not COVID or non-COVID and patients early in their process, ask me about recovery. Like, when will I be recovered? As if there's a line in the sand and one day they're not recovered and one day they're recovered and whole. And so my impression of it is it's, it's gradual. And I think that the further you get from the procedure, the slower things improve. But Susan, from your perspective, Melissa, from your perspective, or Jenna, when do you think you felt recovered or do you, and, and what do you think that, what took to get you there, you think? I mean, for me as a caregiver, mm -hmm. um, the recovery, you know, as my husband recovered after many years, I mean, it's been eight years since his accident, a little over eight years, and truly he's still recovering. So as a caregiver, 
still going through physical therapy, seeing doctors, you know, it's a lifetime, I think. Um, and I think it's the recovery process just keeps going. You know, it definitely for my husband, he's doing amazing, but he works on his recovery each and every day. And I'm sure Alyssa, you, you know, and Jenna, and, you know, I think that's just part of your life. And I think as a caregiver, that's just our new normal and part of life, I think, for us, at least. So maybe you can um, speak, Alyssa. Yeah. Um, I've, ever, I've been asked that before. How long did it take for you to recover? <laughs> People um, ask. It's like. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's I, I asked, how long will it take for me to recover? Um, I obviously every procedure is different. So there's different recovery times for all of those different things, right? So yes, your physical wounds heal very, very quickly on the line of things. Your mental aspect of the whole challenge is something that you continue to, at least in, in my, my life, my story, my journey has, my physical wounds are all healed. Yes. Um, they healed pretty quickly. Um, I still have mental challenges that I'm working through every single day. Like when I get up to pee, I get frustrated. And that's like a whole nother, I feel like it sets back my mental state just a little bit every time I get super frustrated with something. So it's, it's a continuous battle to push the mental strength even farther, even though my, my physical wounds are all healing. And I don't mean for this to sound like oh, you know, it's always going to suck. It's always going to be hard, you know, it, because it's not true. It's just, there's things that are annoying, right? And, and that's just how it is. That's, everybody has things that are annoying and my things are, that are annoying may not be the same as yours and vice versa. But, um, you know, there really is no specific day amount. You know, you can't cross it off on a calendar like June 25th, that's the day that I'm all good. Um, because that's, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. And yeah, Jenna, I, you mentioned I, about, sorry, if I just, you mentioned yeah. about like teams and it's very much a team sport, right? From like the mm -hmm. provider perspective, there's what three to six physicians who are, who care for everybody, right? You can name them and I can name the specialties, but the specialty that we always kind of miss is any sort of like mental health support for any of this. And unfortunately, in all of our tumor boards and all of our cancer committees, you know, there's a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, there's somebody like me who can cut stuff out. But there's, we still fall short of managing that part of the patient in a good way. And that's a, definitely a shortcoming in, I think, US healthcare in general. And, and I think that's one of the things the foundation is good at trying to bridge the gap of I mean, that didn't mean to make that a pitch but um there's obviously so much that modern u.s medicine i think falls short of when it comes to caring for a patient like in a total so just to, well, mean, that and, wasn't a question just a statement i guess yeah <laughs> i think it's a great observation and, and talking about it as the first step because part of that journey of recovery and and i would say i'm still recovering I was diagnosed 20 plus years ago, uh, but I, I will be recovering throughout the rest of my life. And um, even when I had the breast cancer diagnosis, guess what? It reopened the things I didn't deal with because 20 plus years ago, we weren't talking about mental health when it comes to these diagnoses. So thank goodness there were the resources available. So I could deal with those things that came up with another diagnosis. And it's, and, and everybody's journey is different. That's just it. And it's having that variety of resources and, and the proverbial toolkit um, that groups like LPF provide and that providers talk about and patients and caregivers offer that, that really help to ease the journey for those who will be going through it next. Um, so just talking about it this, uh, tonight with, with the, what you three of you are sharing, I think is an important and a huge step forward in those journeys. Um, I did get a, a question here in the chat here. We've got about 10 minutes left. So just a reminder to don't hesitate to, to pipe anything into the chat. There is a little bit about advocacy. Um, and this might actually be good um, for all three of you to comment on about patients who might be timid about pushing back around either an initial diagnosis or perhaps it's a treatment plan. Um, how, how does one advocate? How do you persist? Um, so from the patient 
perspective, um, I'm going to talk. So when I was told amputation was going to be my only option, my mom and I sat there and stared at each other. Like this is not true. Like this has to be a joke. This is not real. So we pushed and got second and third and fourth people to look at doctors, to look at the scans and different recommendations from other doctors. And we went to Texas and we tried to seek out as much uh, confirmation, I guess, as we could to reassure us that like, this is, this is the option. This is the best option. So getting those different opinions and, you know, yeah, that, I mean, none of them were all, nobody was like, yeah, let's save your leg, right? That nobody came to me with that option. So I was reassured in my mind, okay, this is, this is real. I feel safer having had multiple people, multiple doctors, multiple specialties, look at this and tell me the same thing and tell me what's going to be the best option for me. So taking, taking that step of seeking that other opinion, um, you know, maybe, maybe something that brings comfort and, and secures you into, into the situation. Sure. And I, I, I can speak on Maury's behalf as well, um, just because, you know, we did not realize he, you know, after he broke his leg that he had major staph infection. All of a sudden, he's not feeling well, he's not healing well. And we decided, one of the doctors said, well, I don't know if we can save your leg. So thank goodness they sent us to Denver to the limb specialists. And you know, you just have to trust your instincts sometimes and say, this is a healthy person. We've got to find help, you know? And for me as the caregiver, that's what we needed to do. We needed to go see Dr. Wilkins and specialists and find out exactly what's going on. But, you know, and sometimes, you know, my husband was in pain and, you know, we, I had to be his voice. Sometimes you, like your mom, Alyssa, you know, somebody else has to be there to say, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do and find out, you know, alternatives and whatever else, um, you know, along the way. But don't hesitate. You know, if you feel something is not right, ask questions, do research and um, do what you can. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's great advice, Susan, especially on sure. trust in our gut. Are there, there's yeah. a reason when our guts are telling us something. Sure. Um, Dr. Lerman, I'd like to turn to you next. We've got a question about how do you determine the candidacy for osteo integration? That's a good question. There's a few kind of inclusion and exclusion criteria that um, are all pretty soft. I think the key is somebody at this point who has an above knee amputation who is unable to use a socket or a prosthesis as they would like, as at least where the conversation can start. Um, it's really best served by people who have a rather short residual limb. So um, they have a hard leverage using their short femur in a socket or people who have difficult skin issues in socket wear. Um, but I've had plenty of patients come and who are interested in doing this. I think all transfemoral or all above knee amputees struggle with the prosthesis, struggle with a socket. Um, and then there's a few that I've spoken to and I talked to them about the surgery and the risks and things that I think about and worry about. And they decide that their residual limb isn't that bad and they're willing to stick with what they have, um, which is right for some people. And then others, particularly people again, who are short or have a tough time with socket where it's, it's worth a little bit of that risk to them. I mean, it's certainly, it's a risky procedure. For some people, we have to shorten their femur some. So that's a little scary because you burn a bridge a little bit. Alyssa, to your point, it's not growing back. Um, so, so to think that you have to shorten somebody a little bit in order to get the implant and the prosthesis in the right place so that their uh, knee joint lines up with their other knee joint, that's a consideration for some people. But most people who are interested in pursuing this have a rather short residual limb and are struggling with it. Now, um, again, there's some medical details that, aren't particularly exciting or relevant for this crowd that would make somebody a better or worse candidate. But a lot of it is is just struggling with your current situation and, and, and what that struggle is worth to you from a risk reward standpoint. Um, there are, 
I know of a few below knee amputees who've had osteo integration. Um, I think that's a pretty risky procedure from an infection and implant failure standpoint compared to the functional gains. And then there's some above elbow osteo integration patients, which I think <clears throat> is a significant benefit um, because a lot of above elbow amputees even struggle with wearing a prosthesis because usually then it has to get attached to a harness around their chest. And that's a, a difficult implant to drive and control. So for a transhumeral or above elbow amputees, osteo integration, I think is a rather interesting um, utilization. You know, it lets, them, lets someone put on a prosthetic limb relatively easily and have it be relatively easy to attach to their body. But otherwise, it's really a burden. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because we, well, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about legs today. This is also mm -hmm. about arms as well. And so uh, the, the options across all limbs. Yeah, I mean, our arms, you know, our upper extremity amputees <clears throat> obviously struggle in different ways. Um, they're, you know, to elicit to your point, there's just not, there's not as many out them. So they're finding that for them, finding their peer group is even more of a challenge. Um, and the struggles are very unique and specific. I had a patient one time where he said the hardest thing for him to do was to scoop ice cream because he found himself just kind of pushing with one arm because he was just pushing the ice cream across the counter because he didn't have any leverage or any way to hold the ice cream container. Obviously, he was he was half joking, but he he stumbled upon a new obstacle that that I hadn't considered amongst my list of things that were hard to do with one arm, but, but to his, I think he's very right. Um, so unfortunately it's, that's a population who I really just try to connect people with before they have to undergo that procedure. Cause those struggles are, are rather unique and significant. Um, and it's those little things in life that often mean the most there. So the scooping of the ice cream. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, we're getting close to time here. I'll just pause and it open it up for uh, if there's a live question from the audience. I know we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, so just keeping an eye on the clock and I'll just turn to the panel for any last closing words from any of you before I move to some wrap up information. I don't have a question, um, just, but... Oh, sorry. Sorry to jump in like that. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. I, I, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you so much, Alyssa and and Jenna and Dr. Lerman. Thank you very much. I learned so much, and it was just great to be a part of it. And I, I really appreciate your sharing with us all. Thanks for that. And really, thanks to our panel, uh, your first person experience is going to help somebody else's experience. I just know it. Um, so thank you for everything that you shared. We can, I've got just a couple of pieces of information, uh, some public service announcements, if you don't mind me calling them that. So thinking about the Limb Preservation Foundation and opportunities to be part of, uh, of the group here, whether it's volunteering, learning a little bit more, um, sharing any of your generosity, but it's also the power of the word of mouth. Uh, that is a huge help to the Limb Preservation Foundation, whether it's a, a patient in need, a caregiver in need, um, certainly just sharing uh, the, the many resources that the foundation has available. That's just a terrific way to be part. Um, moving ahead, a great new program that the foundation is offering is the peer support program. Hearing from Alyssa, finding, finding your Amber, the, who made so, such a difference in Alyssa's partnership, that's where the peer support program is coming from, uh, from the standpoint of uh, lending an ear, lending that, that personal experience, and, and often offering hope. Um, at the bottom of the screen here, you see an email. If you're interested in becoming part of the peer support program, or if you know someone who might benefit uh, from having this as a support system, please do spread the word on this. Um, and another option is if you're a golfer, please join us this coming June. It's our 22nd uh, golf classic to get out there and, and celebrate together. Uh, so we're just an amazing cause here. So we've got a link there at the bottom. And then finally, moving forward, as I mentioned earlier, we will have an archive version of this, uh, this just tremendous first symposium that we'll be sharing with everyone who registered. We'll have links available on our website and we're available also on your social media channel of choice. Um, I'll highlight out on uh, Instagram and on LinkedIn, there's some just terrific stories of survivors from April, which is Limb Loss Awareness Month. So we've got a couple more days of, 
of celebrating just a, a, a month of um, survival and triumph and celebration. So you can check out some of those stories uh, on our social media channels. So with that, yet again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to our panelists. You have truly offered hope, help, and possibilities this evening. So do appreciate everybody's time and have a good night. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.